Hey, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. Recently, an ISFJ made a post about how when they first discovered Myers-Briggs, they had a little bit of envy for intuitives. That's not uncommon. It's it's sort of a phenomenon in the Myers-Briggs world where intuitives are particularly attracted to the system, probably because it's built on a pattern, and intuitives are attracted to things that are pattern recognition. And also, it gives an explanation for something that a lot of intuitives have experienced, which is a feeling of being alien. And so, there's this thing that explains a phenomenon that literally nothing else has been able to explain, and so intuitives become very attracted to the system, and then become probably the most highly represented demographic that's into type, or particularly Myers-Briggs system. This ISFJ reading all this material that intuitives have written and all these reading all these conversations that they've been involved in said that he got a case of the grass is greener, right? And he was like, oh, it would be really cool to be an intuitive. But then he mentioned he realized that maybe it's maybe it's not all it's cracked up to be. And then it was a really cool post because he said, well, what are some of the things that you intuitives uh, like wish that you had or like characteristics that sensors have? that you intuitives wish that you had? And is there a a case of grass is greener for intuitives going the sensor direction? And it was great because every single post, an intuitive was like, yeah, I love that sensors are more grounded. I love that they're more present. I love, and then just kind of went on and on. But I, I, as I was reading that, I thought, man, I think, I think a lot of us get one of those cases of the grass is greener. I think, I I mean, I, I know I have when it comes to being a thinker woman, I have definitely envied feelers. Like basically as soon as I knew that it was a thing, I was envying feelers and wishing I was a feeler and admiring feeler qualities and characteristics. So what we want to do on today's podcast is we want to talk a little a little bit about this concept of the grass is greener. Like what are the characteristics and qualities that you admire in people of different types? And then can is, is there sort of a way to reconcile this? Is there a way to be very grateful for what you've been given and see all the positives that come with that? And at the same time, you know, keep admiration for people who have these different characteristics. I also saw this comment. And when I read it, I had this visceral memory pop up for me. <laughs> I was probably 15, maybe 16. My brother was probably 12 or 13. And I was playing racquetball with my dad and my brother. And I had this visceral memory of coming out of the racquetball court, having lost a racquetball game to my younger brother, who I don't think even had to hit, he hadn't even hit puberty yet. And he had beat me like three or four games in a row. My brother's an ESFP in the Myers Brake system. And I remember this after I read that, I looked and I remember having this memory of just being in tears of frustration at the age of 15 or 16 because I couldn't beat my little brother at a sport and I should be able to beat him. I'm the older brother. I am smart. I'm intelligent. I'm, I'm fairly athletic, especially at that age. And I can't beat this kid. And I remember that, that memory flowing back to me and remembering how frustrated I was. I couldn't understand why my little brother was able to be that superior at his athleticism over, over me. Now, years later, looking at type, my brother in the Myers-Briggs system is a, an ESFP, and he leads with extroverted sensing or sensation. We've nicknamed it. Of course, he's going to be so good at sports, athleticism. He just understands in, in a very visceral way when a ball is bouncing around how to get to it, how to basically manipulate the you know whatever equipment he's using to be athletic and win against me. And at the time, it was frustrating. Looking back at now, I can see why I was so frustrated. But that memory came to me in like a, a grass is only gr- always greener thing, wishing as a child I was better at sports or athleticism, wishing I could be more sensor-based because a lot of people in my life, my cousins, my brother, and people like that were very sensory in how they showed up. So that that was a visceral hit for me when I read this comment. Yeah, I can remember my sister, my sister who was an ESFJ, always was surrounded by friends. Like she always had a million friends. And is somebody to call at any time and and always had somebody to hang out with. And I remember as a teenager, I mean, she was much older than me. She's about six years older than, than I was. And I remember assuming that that's what teenagers were like. And when I was going, when I became a teenager, I also would have this SWAT team of friends that I could call at any time. And, and it just didn't seem to manifest for me. <laughs> I never had that little SWAT team of friends that could be called at any time until I got much older, until I became in you know like in my late teens, and that was only after I made a concerted effort to study charisma 
and 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 realize that it was like it was something I it was a skill I had to build. I didn't have it naturally. So I, I think what we could do is we could go through maybe some of the dichotomies and maybe even some of the cognitive functions and talk a little bit about what we tend to admire about people that have the other side and then talk a little bit about why it's cool to be the thing that you are. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because we all have a type patriotism for ourselves, right? If I'm an ENFP, which I am in the Myers-Briggs system, I kind of think ENFPs are the best in a lot of ways. Like I love being an ENFP. I've settled in it. I love how I show up to the world. And I kind of have like a, I wouldn't say a superiority complex about being an ENFP, but I think it's really cool to be an ENFP. And I feel bad for all the other types <laughs> that they can't be ENFPs like me. Right? I know. It's, it's really sad, isn't it? I don't know if you have the same thing, Antonio, with being an ENTP or not. But I know this type patriotism comes up, and yet it's almost in our in our in our lives. I think it's schizophrenic that we have this grass is always greener on the other side, while we have so much patriotism for ourselves, and it creates almost this weird nature of like, oh, I wish I was the other. And usually, it's times in deficiencies, right? So as we start to go through these dichotomies, often you know, let's start with let's start with introvert extrovert. You know, I look at introverts. I'm an extrovert in the Myers Briggs system. I'm very extroverted. I look at introverts. And there is some envy often around the ability to be able to be with their thoughts, to be alone, to not need to be around people, to give them energy. Like I, I'm kind of like, that. wow, you, you have such an advantage because if you're dropped off in the middle of the woods at a cabin by yourself, I mean, obviously this is an extreme example, but you probably would be okay for a while, like just with a couple books, with yourself, with your thoughts. I know my friend Dan goes on long hikes on the Pacific Crest Trail and the Appalachian Trail. He's been on the podcast before. And he can just be by himself for days on end. And I think I would start to be driven crazy by that after a while. I'd need to be around people or other energies. It would be hard to be by myself for that much time. And I look at that and I go, man, that that seems like something that I I would love to be able to do more. And I'm, I am trying to ultimately cultivate that in my life because it also helps me grow my co-pilot, right? I don't know if you have one around introverts or not, Antonia, specifically for you. But we can also talk about, I think, a lot of introverts envy extroverts, their ability to go and be social or just get up and do stuff on the the spur of the moment or just be in the crowd in the moment. A lot of introverts report, you know, oh, man, I wish I could do that. I feel left out of the party. I think for me and introverts, the thing that I have a tendency to envy the most is that feeling of being self-contained. Like you have everything you need from within. I don't have everything I need from within at all times. I mean, I can actually, I think that I have a very high tolerance for, well, I learned a high tolerance for boredom when I was a child. And because I learned a high tolerance for boredom, I learned a high tolerance for being alone and by myself, which is basically how I defined boredom when I was young, was just being by myself in my own thoughts with nothing to do. And so because I have such a high tolerance, I actually can be alone for quite a long time. And there is just this moment when I hit a lot of diminishing returns where I'm like, okay, I'm officially going crazy. I have to go. I have to go. I have to go do something. I might not have to go be with a person, but I have to go get out into the world and explore. And I think that the idea of being able to be self-contained feels like it's it's almost like a like like being trained into something that you might need someday in the future. Like, I mean, this is stupid, but like, what if you get thrown into solitary confinement for two weeks for some reason? (laughs) I think about that. I think about that all the time, actually. Yeah, I'm like, not that I'm anticipating ever going to prison and uh, and then getting thrown into solitary, but I've thought about that. I'm like, well, what I, I just, I wouldn't be prepared. And so I do things like, you know, I plan these 10 day Vipassana retreats, these meditation retreats where you have to be silent for basically 10 full days. And I want to go do it. And that feels like boot camp to me. That feels like that would be the equivalent to, to mental boot camp. And so introverts being, I mean, I'm sure there's an introvert listening right now that's like, I don't think I could do that. You know, 10 days of complete silence. And then there's other introverts that are like, that sounds like heaven. How do I sign up for what? How did, how did you spell Vipassana? V-I what? So I know that there's going to be people who run the gambit here. But I, I think for me, the envy is just that complete, complete self-contained, You that you're basically all you need. And then at the same time, I would imagine that if I was an introvert, the thing that I would I I would envy the most is it's it's basically the opposite of what you said, Joel, which is that introverts don't need other people to get energy, but they also don't come with as much energy generally either. Like getting energy, energy, you know, uh, acquisition is it seems like almost always a challenge for introverts. Where are they going to get their energy to do anything? Because they are self-contained. 
And as extroverts, we come with a little bit more energy. We have like, it's almost like um, we have ways to like plug ourselves into the world. Almost like we have like the world provides a tons of ton of outlets for extroverts. So if we get low energy, we just have to go find some place to plug ourselves in. Whereas it feels like introverts are, you know, maybe a, like like it's hard to find the converter they need to plug in to get the energy they need. Like their their plug in is only at home. So they've got like one outlet and it's at home. And if they're not at home, they can't get energy. Whereas we have outlets all over the place. And so I think that energy acquisition would probably be the grass is greener experience I would have if I was an introvert. So so when we're envying each other as introverts and extroverts, I think what we're forgetting is that everything's the cost of specialization. And you mentioned before that we have type patriotism, which I think almost all of us do. When we read about our type, we get a little bit of a hit because not only do we feel understood and that it's explaining us, but also we get to find out how cool we are. Like there's something about going, oh, yeah, I'm an ENTP and here are other ENTPs like me. And like the, and we've got this cool, like inventive style and and we're really good at, you know, coming up with new ideas. And that's awesome. It's affirming. Yes, exactly. It's affirming. That's the perfect word. And so because of that, we nobody wants to lack anything. Nobody wants to believe that by choosing this thing that we think is really cool about ourselves, we're by, de- by definition not choosing a whole bunch of other stuff that's also very cool. And so then when we see other people show up with those things, we immediately have envy because we forget that there's a cost of specialization here. Like in order for me to be cool at the stuff that I'm cool at, I had to, by definition, say no to a whole bunch of other stuff, or at least my mind wiring did, regardless of whether or not it was a conscious choice or whatever. And so I think when it comes to this first dichotomy of introverts and extroverts, there's some really cool stuff that we have a tendency to envy each other around. But there's also an element of, like, if you really saw what, like, some of the stuff they have to deal with, then I, I think the envy would go away, which is why at the end of the day, we choose how we're wired. So introverts have a tendency to admire extroverts' energy and oftentimes their social acumen, which not every extro- extrovert has great social acumen. I didn't start out with great so- social acumen. I had to learn it. But I was also incentivized to learn it because I wanted to be social, right? And so it was a, I was sort of pushed. I pushed myself into it, which, you know, that kind of makes sense. Whereas an introvert might not push themselves into it as much because they have less incentive, they have less need to go out and plug themselves into all of those, you know, external world, outer world outlets, so to speak. Yeah, and but one of the things that being an extrovert is challenging around, I can't be invisible. It's so hard to move through the world without being noticed. And I, I do envy a lot of introverts' ability to move through the world and just fly under the radar because I just can't do that. Like I'm just so loud, even if I'm not visibly or, you know, viscerally loud, like with my vo- voice, my energy just moving through the world is loud. It draws attention. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a complaint that introverts have is that they feel invisible sometimes. And then also, I I know exactly what you're talking about. It's like your energy is loud. And not I don't know if every extrovert has loud energy, but boy, you and I both do. <laughs> and so this idea of always being noticed. Also, being polarizing. There's something about being noticed and and kind of having a louder energy, which means that people feel like they have to form an opinion about you. Yeah, they make a decision about you earlier on. Yeah, exactly. And so I think you get judged a lot more. And so, th- I mean, I, again, I can just hear it like there's good things and bad things that come from it. Then as being an int- introvert, like the thing I don't envy about introverts is that they do have a tendency to have to almost um, like, like they have to train themselves into being seen more because they so naturally will allow themselves to sort of blend in with the background and so there's work they have to do like almost like work I had to do to have friends right to be charismatic I'm I have loud energy but that doesn't necessarily mean good loud energy and for introverts they have to train themselves maybe into being noticed and uh, and and that's got to suck but then at the same time I've noticed that they oftentimes have a better performance because of it and when they're seen, they can control the judgment that comes to them. Like they can sort of control how they're being seen better. 
And so there's uh, there's some envy I have around that too. So is it better to be invisible, but then not be judged as much and be able to control how people are seeing you, like your image? Or is it better to be naturally seen, naturally loud, but then maybe be stompy trompy and, you know, and, and, and have a hard time not realizing why people don't like you <laughs> when you're so loud and visible? By the way, if you're listening and you're like, that doesn't resonate with me, I'm an extrovert and I don't resonate with anything you say, or I'm an introvert, that doesn't res- resonate with me at all. Just know that we're, we are overgeneralizing some things here a little bit for the sake of conversation. Mileage may vary. You may have a unique individual experience of this. You might be an extremely social introvert or extremely quiet and kept yourself extrovert. And those things happen. We've seen it you know, in all of our clients and students and lots of you know, doing this almost 10 years. We've seen all the different types expressed in very different ways. But I think these are some general things to think about because whatever you envy about other types and people that are the other from you is going to be unique to you. And so take the principles of what we're saying, even if the specifics don't resonate with you directly. Yeah, the the principle being that there's always a cost to everything. All the good stuff comes with bad stuff, and all the bad stuff comes with good stuff. And so when you feel envy for the other, just remember it's coming with a bunch of stuff that you might not be seeing that it also, like it's it's a package deal. You don't just get all the good stuff and then you don't have to deal with any of the bad stuff. What's the old uh, phrase that what crosses supports you and what supports you crosses you? And that's the case across the board. I think I, I think about, I used to work at uh, the zoo in Baltimore and I talked to the people in the development department, development departments into fundraising, right? And so their job at the zoo was to raise money for the zoo because it's a nonprofit. And the individuals that worked in this one department had to go meet with very wealthy people, trust fund kids, people that had a lot of wealth, and were donating large sums of money to the zoo. And I remember asking one of the women that worked there one time, like, what's that experience like? And she said, really, what's interesting is people that have a lot of wealth are, you know, people have envy for them, but they have a lot of problems. They have a lot of issues, like they have issues that most people can't relate to because it's some, they're, they're very different from other people. And I remember really having a lot of empathy for people that were extremely wealthy, thinking, I bet no one cares about their problems because they're like, well, they're wealthy. What do they? What does it matter? They don't have any problems because we assume people with resource don't have challenges in life. They don't get sad. They don't have people in their, in their life die. They don't have children that are rebellious or do stuff that you know, screws over the family or, you know, we just assume it's all going to be good or we assume that they're all terrible and, ter- you know, horrible people. But when she told me this, she said that, you know, a lot of their love with their parents and themselves is wrapped up in money and transfer of wealth. And I started to get a p- picture of something that I, you know, envied these people that had a lot of resource. And I went, you know, I bet it's not always rosy over there. I bet there's a lot of challenges that come with having lots of resource that I can't relate to because I don't have that kind of resource. I'm not a trust fund child. I didn't have millionaires as parents. And it gave me a perspective to start looking at people with a more open eye, a more uh, open frame to see, I bet they're struggling with things I can't relate to necessarily. And I just want to mention that as we bring that into this conversation, that as we begin to talk a little bit more about some of the type envy you might have as you're listening, or at least the type envy we're uh, proposing that some people might have, it's interesting to start to reframe. It's easy to say, well, they over there have all this taken care of for them. It's so easy. And I don't think that's always the case. I think everybody has challenges. Everybody has problems. And I think that idea of cost of specialization is so key, Antonia, because when you specialize in anything, whether it's your type or your interests or your, you know, your career, you are saying no to a bunch of other stuff. And with that comes a lot of challenges, just by definition. Everybody's got challenges, no matter who they are. Yeah, like exceptionally beautiful people or exceptionally smart people or whatever. Every, everybody's got something. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, so I look at I look at like ENTJs, for example, as a type. I'm always envious of the ability for an ENTJ to craft and build, not all ENTJs, but I've known enough ENTJs that can craft and build organizational design with their extroverted thinking, effectiveness process, and build these really you know, amazing companies or resource generating companies or products and services and be able to manage all these people. And I'm always like, man, I just like, I envy that a lot. And I, I've even got into my 10 year old tertiary process of extroverted thinking at times thinking I could become that if I just put enough effort into my effectiveness, you know, extroverted thinking, 10 year old tertiary process, I could become just like an ENTJ and I strive and I strive and I just can never seem to, to get to the level that I see ENTJs performing at. And it seems like 
I don't have what it takes. And I start to beat myself up about it and like, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not quality enough. I can't build a company like they can build. I, I'm not good managing people the way they can manage people and resource. And just they just have a knack for it. And I have to remember, you know what? There's a bunch of stuff that comes with being an ENTJ that's not cool either that I don't have to deal with, right? The feeling process for an ENTJ is their inferior three-year-old process, introverted feeling. It's sometimes hard for ETJs to know what they're feeling or to have a nuanced experience of what they're feeling. And to some degree, I don't envy that at all. Like that seems very difficult to move through the world not really being in touch with because I'm very in touch with how I feel about things. And so I realized, you know, many years ago, oh, I don't have to do this the way an ENTJ would. I can be who I am as an ENFP. I can show up and get in touch with my feelings and I can lead and build things in a very different way. But these are some things, like I'm, I'm bringing that real example in because we're kind of talking about the abstract, like, oh, introverts feel this way, extroverts feel this way. But I think there's probably a type that you listening have in your mind, like, if only I was this type, or if only I was this kind of person, if only I had this in my life, and you may even strive for that, and then it falls short of what you want to do or who you think you could be, and now you feel bad about yourself. Yeah, like, I think uh, to, to your point, talking specifically about ENTJs, it's not even that they struggle with knowing how they feel. It's that they're so good at kicking that can down the road. And until it gets to a place where now maybe sometimes those feelings have metastasized. Totally. And so that's the challenge. I think that's that's the thing about each of these types is that we're really good at kicking some can down a road. And I know I'm particularly good at kicking that introverted sensing can <laughs> until... What could have been a $10 parking ticket has now become an $88 parking ticket that I just woke up. I mean, I just opened it up today, literally. And I was going to pay it. <laughs> like, that's the thing is I was so I was going to pay it. You couldn't find the paperwork, though. You're I, like, where did I put this? Where did I put that? Wandering around the house looking for this random scrap of paper. And you literally found it today. And I'm like, oh, good, I'll pay it. And then I get a piece of paper in the mail. That says now with all the fees, because it's been a month, it's now $88 and that they're going to send like actually I got one from like the local county saying that like I'm I'm now in Dutch with the law because I didn't pay this parking ticket. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So, yeah. So I'm good at kicking my cans down the road, too. And I think every type is do is good at that. Can you record the podcast from jail? Are you going to be able to like if I can call you on the phone line and you can do your part on that side? Yeah, like I'll just make that my my phone call for the day <laughs> when I'm in Dutch with the fuzz for not paying my $10 parking ticket. <laughs> I'll just cue it in through Skype. We'll record it on here. Sounds good. This is my new, it's like this is my life now. Absolutely. Well, I am waiting. I, I am waiting at some point to get in trouble with the law. I, I don't know how. I mean, I did earlier say that I don't expect to be in solitary confinement, but I do prepare for the moment. Because- if it's paperwork related, it's going to happen. If we get into some sort of dystopian future where paperwork is sort of the symbol for whether or not you're a contributing member of society, I am definitely in trouble. But going back to, didn't we have a framework when we we're going to talk about dichotomies? Yes. Okay. So let's go back to that one and let's go to the next one, which is sensor and intuitive. So this actually was what kicked us off to begin with, which was the ISFJ and the Intuit Awakening Group talking about some of the things that intuitives might envy in sensors. And I, he didn't use the word envy. I use that word. But th- there's, there's a, this is one that's kind of interesting because I believe that there is type envy for intuitives. And I think once we find out that we're intuitives, those of us who are, we get really excited. And this thing that maybe we thought was bad and wrong about us all of a sudden is incredibly validated. And now we think we're the like now we're hot stuff, right? We're intuitive. So we're hot stuff. And then and then you realize that there is a lot of diminishing returns to being intuitive. And there's actually quite a few of them. I would say that the thing that I'm really coming to grips with is how difficult it is for me to stop taking a meta perspective on everything. I I can't help it. I just zoom out. Like as soon as anybody says anything about anything in life, I'm instantly taking a meta perspective. I'm zooming out and I'm studying the thing they're talking about. This gives me extraordinary distance. I'm like one degree of separation from all of my, from my entire life. My whole life, I live one degree of separation which is probably one of the reasons why intuitives have a tendency, if other intuitives are like me, have a tendency to feel like an alien. Like we're always on the outside looking in. And it's because we are. It's because we just zoom ourselves there as fast as possible. A person is talking to me about something that, that's going on in their life and I can't help but study it from the outside. It's just, it's autoresponder at this point. And I do that 
with almost everything. So the struggle I've had is is being here, right here, right where I'm sitting, present to the moment, remembering that I'm sitting on a chair, remembering that there's a cushion under my butt that's separating me from the chair, remembering that there's an arm here that's holding a microphone in front of me and I'm looking at you, Joel, right in front of me and like I'm in a room and it's kind of warm and like... Like this is where I'm at. I'm present. This is my mo- this this is all that exists. And I I've had to do years of training, years of meditation, years of float tanks, years of meditation retreats. Like it's taken me so long to get to a point where I'm just here in my life. <laughs> That's crazy. That's almost asinine, really, if you think about it. And that was the number one thing that Intuitive said in that thread, which was that they admire the sensor ability to simply be present. I resonate with that so much. I think the idea of being present is something that, uh, at least the sensors in my life, like family and friends that are my sensor friends and family, have a knack for of getting into action, not overthinking things, and still thinking deeply about things. I mean, it's. I think there's this misnomer that you know, intuitives, they think deeper or they're more smart or something. I don't think that's true at all. It's just a different way of thinking, quite frankly. A more intuitive way of thinking, more abstract, more, you know, guesswork. More meta. Yeah, more meta perspective. But there is something to be said for, I mean, simple stuff like being able to do handyman stuff around the house is something I'm like, you know, I I hearken to my father and my brother who are both SPs in the Myers-Briggs system and they have a knack for being able to just hang a picture without like, struggling with it like it takes me so much it's so much harder for me to do basic stuff it's such a production yeah it's just like i have to go it's just like it's so much harder for me and i just feel like deficient often when i'm trying to do physical things often uh so that's that's definitely a challenge and i i definitely feel like uh i don't have a sense of the physicality of things they they sometimes baffle me or confuse me which is weird right because i live in a physical world but sometimes i'm like how does this like simple things confuse me about the world and how they work i take this this concept and like the moments that i'm the most present are the ones that are very slow like when time time stands still and it's a slow moment and i'm like it's almost like undeniably i'm undeniably present like we have um a deck in our backyard or like uh, attached to our our house and there's this really nice sitting area out there. And in the morning, I'll grab coffee. I'll take the French press outside and I'll sit down and the sun will be on me and I'll be I'll be drinking coffee and this breeze will come through. And I'm like, oh man, I am undeniably present. And I'm, I feel really triumphant in that moment, by the way. I feel super triumphant that I'm in that moment. And I realize the reason why is because it's a simple moment. Like there's nothing complicated about what's going on. It's very easy for me to be present there. And then I think, what if I could be that present in moments that are complicated, in moments that there's a lot going on? There's tons of stimuli being thrown at me. There's lots of things happening around. What if I could be that present in a complex moment? And I just can't. I cannot get there. And I mean, I don't know if I'm right or not, but being present is very much associated with being zen for me being at peace being calm being like like not being too anxious or worried knowing it's going to be okay not not being anxious about the future or regret about the past just being in this moment and it's it's so tough it's so tough to do it so i think that that idea that uh that there's there's all this stuff that intuitives have on sensors and that the only thing that sensors have on intuitives is that is that they're more responsible or that they you know that they we we talk a lot about our inability to get paperwork done right our very expensive inability to get paperwork done my $88 <laughs> fees <laughs> because i can't get paperwork done we talk a lot about that kind of stuff but the the thing i admire the most about sensors is that ability to be present and i think i think i'd be a happier human being I think I'd be happier and I and I keep striving for it. I keep trying to get there and it is literally always a struggle. I run probably hmm, four times a week and I, I off and on, off and on throughout my entire adult life, I've been a runner. There have been chunks of time when I wasn't at all, but for the most part, I've run about three to four times in my life. I've gotten a runner's high twice, twice in my entire life I've gotten a runner's high. Do you know how hard it is to be a consistent runner when you never get a runner's high? When like every mile is just 
like just sheer determination and will, it's not easy. And I'm like, man, if I was a sensor, I'd have a runner's high in like two seconds. <laughs> I just, I just know it. I just know I just can't get in my body enough to do it. So there are a lot of things that I very much admire about sensors and, um, and that it's a grass is greener thing. Like, like I, I think if somebody asked me at this stage in my life, if I would choose to be a sensor, I'd be like, can I do it for like half the rest of my life? I, I would, I would say yes. Wow. I, I don't know if I would do that. I, I really enjoy being who I am and my type. I don't know if I would actually be another. Yeah. But see, remember, if I was a sensor, I'd be an ESTP. And those guys are awesome. <laughs> ESTPs are awesome. When you'd, they're not You'd have horrible. a Harley Davidson. You'd be just driving around. I'd have a conversion van. And it would be like a super simple life. And I, my, I would like, I would have this really super nice conversion van and I'd live off of like the, the, the coast in Southern California and I just wouldn't have a care in the world. I'm pretty sure that that's what ESTPs do. That sounds good to me now. Right? That's, that sounds delightful. So let's move on to think or feeler. Really? We're not going to talk anything about what there would be for intuitives? Or is we, that just assumed? Well, we can. I mean, I, I think, okay, I think that sensors tend to have an envy around an intuitive's ability to to pattern recognize so quickly. Because I think, obviously, sensors have an intuitive part of them, right? It's in the backseat of their car, or lower on the stack in their cognitive function stack or the car model. And they have an intuitive part of them. It's just not as fast. It's not as readily available. It's less trusted. And so I think at the core, I think the uh, from what I've observed, and some sensors have told me, they, they envy the ability to trust the intuition or the patterns that you're forming and the speed at which you're able to trust those or to act upon them. I think that's something that I think a lot of sensors report to me and, and I've seen observing them in the wild, quote unquote. Uh, I don't know if you've seen other, I mean, obviously there's other ob- observations of things that they would potentially envy, but I think that's one big one that I've noticed. Yeah, trusting intuition. I, and I think when you get past all the, like the woo-woo magical components of being an intuitive, which it's not woo-woo or magical, I think that sensors have an ability to, well, we're talking about kicking cans down the road, right? Implications. Like the the ability to not look at the implications of something. The ability to sort of put your head in the sand when it comes to, you know, the, the, what's really going on here? Like what's, what is the meta perspective? What's going on in a bigger game implication level? And intuitives can't help but think in those terms. Like they're almost always thinking in those terms. Sensors have an ability to sort of put that off for a while. And then if they've done that, then life hits them really hard, right? There's like this moment when life is just like pounding them because they didn't want to have to see everything. They didn't want to have to see the big picture. They, did, they, they, were, they were content. They allowed themselves to be content. Or they didn't think they could handle it if they did see it. So it, it nags at the back of their head. I've seen this happen with somebody in my life right now. There's, there, this person is an intuitive tertiary or... 10 year old process and they have been ignoring a pattern that's very obvious to them for so long and all of a sudden it is no longer able to be ignored but because they ignored their little intuitive voice that was telling them hey you should probably address this this is going to be a this implication is going to be bad in the future it's almost it's not too late yet but it's going to be too late very soon because they've ignored it so long and i think that's the that's probably the thing that i don't envy at all about that ability to suppress that because i think those implications are are key and if you suppress those implications then that can lead to bad things right yeah yeah so when you're looking at sensors envying them that ability to be present that ability to be in their life uh, the ability to not have to overcomplicate everything or take a meta perspective like being there and present comes with an ability to sort of shove off implications at times right and so so there's good stuff and bad stuff that comes with it as whereas being an intuitive you're just perpetually thinking about implications and perpetually thinking in that meta perspective but now you're one degree of separation from your life so there's good there's good stuff and bad stuff and of course what's nice is that we know that both of these things are available so like just like an introvert can you know learn to be more seen and an extrovert can learn to withdraw and go inside and understand who they are better, which is not really something we talked about. Uh, one thing I do admire about introverts, just to kind of harken back to that, is their ability to know themselves so well. That is actually probably my biggest envy. I should have said that before. But that ability to know yourself so well. 
uh, that's something that we as extroverts can learn, just like an introvert can learn how to be seen. Intuitives can learn to be present. Like it's always a struggle. It's always hard. But with determination, you can do that. You can find tools and avenues to get you present. And a sensor can find tools and avenues to take a meta perspective, to think in longer timelines and understand implications and just see what's going on in their life. Like use that ability to be present, to not just exist, but actually observe and 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 not have life sneak up on you if there's something coming. So let's switch over to the third dichotomy, thinker versus feeler. And this is actually interesting for us because you're a thinker, Antonia. I'm a feeler. I have a lot of envy for thinkers. I always think that you guys are so smart and you have words available to you. And, you know, I've, I've talked about this before on the podcast, some of those just general envy. But I think the biggest thing I envy about thinkers is the ability to compartmentalize your feelings as you move through the world and seemingly not have them affect you. Like you can continue on, like if I've got something that's emotionally heavy I'm dealing with, it overwhelms my day. I like, it's on top of my mind. It's hard for me to get things done. It's hard for me to focus on stuff. And I look at you and you're like, ah, I just kind of push that out of my head and do what I got to do. And I'm like, how do you do that? I would love to be able to do that. So I think I... That's one probably non-obvious envy that I have for you thinker types out there of your ability to compartmentalize so well. Well, I think that that's true. I think that thinkers have a better ability to compartmentalize until we don't. That's true. You know what I mean? Like like it's um once we hit an emotional overwhelm and and it and it usually takes a lot, but once we do, I think that it incapacitates us. <laughs> It's like we're 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 good at compartmentalizing until the dam breaks and then we don't have any ability to deal with it. But I think the what what comes along with that ability to compartmentalize is an ability to compartmentalize. It's that kicking the can thing again. We have the ability to not address emotionally heavy things, maybe relationship issues or maybe um you know just like traumas from our past or whatever it is whatever something that should be addressed and we're just really good at not addressing it and then again these things sneak up on you you can only ignore things for so long and then maybe a relationship is dying or exploding and the reason why is because you you were able to avoid looking at something that if you had addressed that emotional thing not that long ago or whatever, or like at the time that you realized it was maybe a challenge or a problem and you didn't do so and now it's coming back to haunt you. Maybe it's uh, like, like I think, I think both thinkers and feelers can have an equal disdain for conflicts. Thinkers are a little bit more likely to bite the bullet and accept the conflict that's necessary to get through a situation and feelers are less likely to do that, to do that. But I think I don't think anybody really likes conflict, and that includes thinkers. Even the even the thinkers that appear to like conflict, usually that's not them liking the feeling of being out of connection with other people. It's usually them trying to differentiate themselves or trying to prove themselves because they don't think connection is possible. So, like the really conflicty thinkers, I think that it's actually an over. I, I think it's a um, what's the word? Sort of a uh, overcompensation. For, for a belief that they can't connect. But that said, I do think that uh, when, when thinkers get to a place where they, uh, they have to create some sort of harmony, this is the moment when I start to really envy feelers because at the time that conflict needs to be you know, healed, it's almost always the feeler that has the right thing to say that is understanding of the other person or is in simpatico with them enough emotionally so that as they're trying to create harmony there like there's like this sense the other person feels like yep, that that they're on their side when the feeler finally wants to create harmony they're totally on the other person's side and that gets read whereas I can be I can show up with absolutely amazing intent and completely want to heal the conflict and still say all the wrong things <laughs> still say all the things that makes the person go like what do you mean and uh, it's uh, it's that smoothness of simpatico that I think I really envy. I had this experience a couple of weeks ago where I got, I just had this this insight into what it must be like to be a thinker and in particular, an introverted thinker. So a TP in the Myers Briggs system, and it really it's something I don't envy that I think a lot of TPs deal with people that use introverted thinking or what we've nicknamed accuracy. If they use this as a strength, 
I don't envy this aspect. And I think it's, and I'm sure extroverted thinking people also have this happen as well. It was this insight I had that, oh, you're just speaking like truth and data into the world. And people are emotionally reacting to information. And I just had this realization that must be extremely confusing to somebody that's a thinker. Like it must be extremely confusing why a piece of truth like, hey, that car over there is yellow. And then there's this emotional reaction to something that was said. I mean, I'm, it's a, that's not a very uh, severe statement. But I watch people become outraged by a lot of stuff in our world. And I bet you as a thinking person, if you're listening and you're a thinker, it probably maybe not baffle you anymore because you're used to it if you're an adult and you've had to experience this in your life. But I bet you it can be very confusing. Why does everybody turn everything that's just informational into something emotional all the time? And I bet that's something that you almost like, you don't envy in the uh, feeler being able to do that, but you envy feelers being able to understand why this is emotional maybe, or being able to navigate that. If I said something to somebody and they reacted emotionally, I understand that as a feeler. Like it makes sense to me why someone would react emotionally. But I look at the thinkers in my life and when people react emotionally, they're confused. Sometimes they get angry. Sometimes they're hostile to it. Sometimes they're dismissive. They just remove themselves from the situation. Usually hurt though. Hurt, you know, whatever the emotion, whatever they're feeling or experiencing on their side. And I think that it's, I I just had this very clear like insight into that, what that must feel like. And I bet that's really, like, that helped me get some some sympathy for the thinkers in my life to go, oh, that's that's probably really difficult to navigate through. Yeah, it it can be a challenge, for sure. I mean, that's been troubling for you, right? Like, you've had trouble with that at times? Yeah, I've had to figure out, I mean, information is so tough. Like, I I even went through a a time period where I was like, just full transparency on everything, that's, that will solve it. If I'm just equally transparent about everything at all times, then that then the person will just know that that's my style. And so I really embraced radical honesty. I've actually been backpedaling a little bit from even though I've like talked about the importance of radical honesty ad, ad nauseum on the podcast. And I still believe it's incredibly important for people specifically using introverted thinking. But really anybody should, needs to be honest with themselves. They need to be radically honest with themselves. But I'm also realizing that people are not that responsible with information. In fact, people are really irresponsible with it. Both with the information itself and the emotional reactions to that information. Yeah, exactly. Like like people are really bad at determining what they should know and what they shouldn't know and then what to do with that information. People are kind of astonishingly bad. And I think that um, thinkers have a little bit more respect for this this idea of when a piece of information should be given and when it should be withheld. The, thinkers respect information more, I think, than feelers do because feelers are respecting emotions more than thinkers are. And so there's this, uh, I think that there's a, I think there's a challenge that thinkers have sometimes with what information will this person be responsible with and sometimes you don't know that until you've already given the person the information and now yay, they were responsible. Good. That was a good gamble. Or no, they're totally irresponsible. And now everything is blowing up. (laughs) And so there there can be some challenges around that. But I think uh, I think there is I mean, I like being a thinker. I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of stuff about being a thinker I'm very happy with. However, when I go hang out with like um, my ISFP sister in law, and every little kid within a mile radius is like coming up to her for hugs and just snuggle and you know they just snuggle inside and she's got this warm sweet demeanor and she's like the baby whisperer right she's actually the kid whisperer just every kid just loves her and kids don't love me like they don't dislike me usually there's this sort of like like a uh, there's a a respect and oftentimes I kid with them I joke with them and I almost treat them a little older than they actually are And so they like the fact that I don't treat them like little kids, but I'm not this safe, warm, squishy, snuggly presence in their life. And I envy that. I envy feelers' warmth. I envy that people just feel warm and safe around them oftentimes. Not every feeler, obviously. Again, you mentioned before, these are trends. They're not rules. But uh, but there's there's that part of a feeler that I've always really wished I could I, I could be warmer. I wished I was a warmer person. I wish that I was more of um, a, a feeling of emotional safety. I 
And I and I think if I could trade for that, I definitely would. I I would think I would trade some of my positives to get that one because I think I I wish people felt emotionally warm and safe in my presence. So like I mentioned before, sometimes I'm around thinkers and I feel I feel dumb. It's not because I don't feel like I'm cerebral or I can process information. I think I'm an intelligent person and insightful. But I I envy the fact that thinkers seem to have the information so readily available. They don't have to... I feel like I have to navigate a pathway of some emotion or experience sometimes to get my thoughts clear. And it seems clear in my head, but then when I try to articulate or try to unpack something digitally or, you know, in a thinker way, I feel it it comes off flat. It doesn't necessarily resonate as well. It doesn't make as much sense to somebody as I'm trying to articulate something. And I know other feelers have expressed this too. Sometimes we feel like we envy the ability of the thinker types to be able to just access information, process information, categorize it correctly, and pull on it almost at will. When for me, it's like, it's very difficult to do. And I think that I would also like to have more of that like in my life, right? And I know that the cost of specialization for me is the ability to deeply get in touch with the resonant emotions I'm feeling and to move through experientially in my introverted feeling process as an ENFP in the Myers-Briggs system to understand the real personal, deep, resonant core value motivations I'm experiencing and other people are experiencing, which if I had more of that cerebral access to information, maybe I wouldn't be as in touch with. So there's a bunch of benefits I get from how I'm wired but it still doesn't take away the sting of envy a little bit for the other, especially if we're in the, you know, oftentimes with this podcast, I'll do all this like talking and then you'll come on and say something really insightful and brilliant that's really buttoned up in your introverted thinking. Like, oh man, she said it so much, she sounds so much smarter than I do when I'm like bumbling around trying to find my conceptual, even right now, like I feel like I'm trying to find my conceptual, what I'm trying to say. And so sometimes I envy that ability. And sometimes I envy the credit that thinkers get because of it. You know, oftentimes you'll get a lot of credit, Antonia. And I'll take a, I'll take a little bit of ego hit. It's, it's hard. I've, I've done a lot of work around it. And now I don't care as much. But in, in days past, when it's like, oh, Antonia is so smart about this. She's so insightful. I'm like, oh, man, I wish I was smart and insightful for people. I wish I came off that intelligent. But I realize I have a very different kind of intelligence that comes through. Yeah. Well, and the, the trade-off is that now we're talking about ourselves, but... You, the listener, regardless of whether or not you're a thinker or a feeler, you can probably kind of, you probably resonate with some of the stuff that we're talking about. You're, you're best experienced in person when you are doing your emotional keto on a room. Like, I don't, I don't even think people notice how much you're doing, but like at live events, you do so much emotional keto from the stage, you create such an extraordinary container that it makes it so that everybody does feel safe. Like that thing I'm talking about, that feeling of safety, that emotional safety, you're able to create that in a room. And so when I'm talking or teaching, people can open up their minds to be able to learn better. So you create a container or an experience, like like experience is where you shine. And I think most feelers are like that. They they shine when it comes to creating an experience. And uh, and I think thinkers are, you know, better at uh, transmitting information and resource and that's just sort of the the that's the the places we play well and one more thing that I wanted to mention in a lot of these grass is greener conversations there are certain societal I don't think that the word is expectation but biases towards some of these dichotomies totally yeah so like I mean going back to the beginning uh, I mean, introverts could probably envy that extra. There's a societal bias towards extroversion in the country that we live in, if you live in this country as well. But then there's other countries around the world where introversion is more prized. So one of the things that we might have a grass is greener experience around is what is the culture you're living in and which bias is it going towards? There's you, you mean stuff like extroverts getting promotions, like job promotions. Mm-hmm. maybe elevated, getting leadership positions because they're so out there in our culture in the United States. It's such a extroverted culture that they get rewarded for that societally. Exactly. And then and then you can tell when you've entered one of the cultures that prizes introversion more because, I mean, as an American, I know because I go in and they talk about how loud and bombastic and obnoxious all Americans are. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you're one of the cultures that prizes introversion more. And so if you're a loud, bombastic, obnoxious extrovert in one of those cultures, then you might feel like, you know, you envy introverts. Traditionally in this country, in the United States, censors have been more, like the ones that kind of more set the tone of culture. 
But right now, and we even talked about this a little bit in our Why the World Needs Extroverted Intuition podcast, right now there's actually a lot of novelty bias that we have. And so intuition, the creative class, knowledge work, you know, like uh, keeping up with all of the technological, you know, innovations, all of this has made it so that we're having a bias more towards intuition at this point. And that's a, that's a shift. We, we're not used to that. So I could see why intuitives would have maybe traditionally envied sensors that the culture felt more like it was designed for them. But I could see that changing sensors more envying intuitives because of the cultural shift and that we're heading more towards that, that creative class knowledge work bias where intuitives are seem to be the ones that play a little bit better in that space. With thinking and feeling, I think traditionally we have very much had a bias for thinking, right? Especially during the industrial age, for, for sure, right? Everything has been like, uh, you know, post-World War II, everything was like, make, it, make mathematicians and scientists. <laughs> we have a race to the moon, right? So thinking was the big deal. But I think right now I'm feeling a cultural shift towards feeling. I can feel it. I don't know if I'm accurate or not, but it feels like right now, particularly in the social zeitgeist, Feelers have a bit of an edge in understanding how all this works, how the, all this concepts around like, you know, how we should be feeling about things socially and politically and how we should be treating each other. This feels like a, a, a situation that feels a little bit more hostile to thinkers and we're not used to that as much. So right now, one of the things I'm envying about feelers is that they seem to understand what's going on right now in the world a lot better than I do. I don't really get it. And and I get some pushback for it where I'm like, I'm, I'm just saying the same thing I've been saying for a long time and now all of a sudden it's unacceptable and it's like it doesn't it doesn't make sense that it's unacceptable just because it's you know for me like you were saying that car is yellow right isn't that what we've been saying and it's like well when you're in a world where data is a little bit you know this postmodern world where data isn't data and information isn't information and facts aren't facts then it's a very intuitive world and it's a very feeling world. And uh, and that, and so one of the things I envy right now about feelers is that they seem to be getting this better than I am. Well, yeah. I mean, there's also a danger in leading with belief or what you think something should be and then trying to find the data to back it up. I look at it and I say, you know, I still envy the thinkers being able to cut through some of that to get to the core of what's actually going on at the end of it all. Again, we're going to come from our different viewpoints and have envy for the types that were not because we, we tend to envy the people that have covered our blind spots, right? In a lot of ways. I think, uh, but, I think that cultural thing, though, is really key. I think that you're right. I think there is a lot of cultural elements to that. You're going to say something? No, I was just going to say one of the things we could talk about, too, is what you like about being a feeler. I, like, I enjoy being able to read a room, being able to connect with people emotionally, being able to you know, lead emotionally, quite frankly. I enjoy being able to help people find the emotions that they want to feel or that will be beneficial for them in a lot of situations. And I know a lot of thinkers, I think, would struggle with that, being able to pe have people have those experiences. So I think that's really beneficial. Uh, I enjoy there. I kind of enjoy being tapped into the, the group dynamic and the feelings that are happening there. I like being a feeling support for people in my life. Like if you're going through a difficult time, Antonio, I love being there for you emotionally and being centered. In fact, I actually show up better for people outside of myself than even myself sometimes. I'm more centered if somebody else is having a hard day than I am for myself having a hard day, right? It's really interesting that I can be a ballast for others even more than myself. Now, I've worked on that. I'm, I'm also learning how to be a ballast for myself even more. But that's something that's been really powerful for me as a feeler. And I enjoy that. I think it's a really good aspect. Do you, do you have things you enjoy about being a thinker that you haven't said yet? Yeah. Well, I love, I love my problem-solving abilities. Yeah. I, I love being able to size up a situation pretty quickly. And I like I like that I retain, like you were talking about, I retain information at pretty high amounts. And I have a system in my head for almost everything. And so when I run into a situation, it's very rare when I feel overwhelmed by it. Like I, I, I very rarely feel overwhelmed because I'm like, no, I can figure this out. And then I just got to find the model or the system you know, or, or just break something apart, figure out what the nodes in the system are, which is the node that needs to be influenced, what will have the leverage point, what will create a different emergent property. Like my brain is just wired to think this way. And so it's very rare that I feel overwhelmed because I just, I walk into a situation knowing I can deconstruct it and that through the deconstruction, I can figure out how to solve it. Now, it is frustrating when I see solutions that 
I recognize that literally nobody else will understand. Uh, not that they can't understand it, but they don't care. <laughs> There's so many times where I'm like, oh, yeah, we could totally solve this in like five minutes, but literally nobody else cares. So we're just going to deal with this problem probably for eternity. <laughs> and it's like, OK, that's a little frustrating. But there is some satisfaction in knowing that I know a, a potential solution. And so, yeah, I think that there's I think that there's satisfaction there. Another thing that I think about when I'm thinking about feelers, and if you're a feeler, you might you might resonate with this. I don't know. Uh, my energy coach, Glenn, told me this this statement a few weeks ago. And I actually might want to do a whole podcast around it. But he said, every fear is a fear of feelings. Every fear is a fear of feelings. And I thought, that's really an interesting concept. I, don't, I haven't really thought in complete depth to that. But I don't fear many feelings. Like there's some feelings I fear, right? I'm in the in the Enneagram system. I'm in the fear triad. So I, I'm an Enneagram six social. So I have I have fear kind of wired to me, anxiety, fear. And that really resonated with me that to say, I that seems right. Like that seems at least compelling, if not right. I don't know if it's empirically right or 100 percent true. But that's interesting because it does feel like feelers deal with fear more than thinkers do, from my perspective. It feels like that. And I wonder if it's because thinkers aren't thinking about the feelings they're going to have unless they're thinking about them. Like they're not fearful until they have to face those feelings. And sometimes they can, again, that compartmentalization part that I envy. It's almost like I envy the ability for thinkers to move through the world a little bit more fear, fearless than what I see feelers moving through the world. It appears to me, and again, not, not empirically, this is just anecdotal, that feelers tend to move through the world with more reservation and fear or Res, like reservation and anxiety or fear than thinkers do from my perspective. And uh, that's something that I think is really interesting to think about that I bet if a thinker is thinking about what they're fearing, the emotions they're fearing, they're probably crippled by it. And I certainly don't envy that. That seems like that's overwhelming and, and completely crippling to someone. Mm, that is a fascinating, I, you hadn't told me that yet. That's yeah. a really fascinating thing to say. We could do a whole podcast on it potentially. Unpack would... it. I think I would love to deconstruct that concept that every fear is a fear of feelings. Huh, that is, that's really, I'm going to have to think about that for a while. Uh, yes, and I don't think about the feelings that are going to come with the situation. It's not something that comes on my radar. I think I always think about them. Like from moment one, okay, what am I going to feel if this plays out this way? Yeah, I totally don't. <laughs> I totally don't think about it. I just go, okay, this is the thing that has to be done. And then while it's happening and I'm feeling all the feelings, I'm like, oh, this is not good. This is this isn't good. This is going to hurt. This is going to leave a mark. Yeah. But I don't think about that at first, except um, there are certain emotions that are, I've talked about this before, my list of unacceptable emotions, which I either just refuse to feel, I just won't feel them. Or if I think a situation is going to make me feel them, I will be avoidant of that situation. Yeah. So societal expectations, we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. I want to pivot to the last dichotomy, judge mm. or perceiver. Yeah. I actually think this plays, society expectations play a lot in this. And the envy or the acceptance of yourself or envy of the other probably plays a lot in this too. Because the judge or perceiver split, you know, I'm a perceiver in the Myers-Briggs system. I have a lot of envy for judges too because they tend to be on time and get things done. And, you know, the, all the stereotypes of judges, all the things that we talk about or they're just written on like these stereotypical things about judges, I, I tend to look at them and go, man, they're, they're, they're able to do a lot of things because they're so organized on timelines. They seem like they plan things and execute their plans. And like, oh, man, I could get so much more done if only I was a, like an INTJ or something or an INFJ instead of an ENFP. Like I could just get so much more accomplished. So I tend to envy judges' ability. And I think we've been in a very judger world in the past, maybe 50 years or so. But I think expectations of society is changing now. I think it's starting to flip. I think we're starting to become much more of a perceiver-centric culture, something that is very much honoring the, the perceiver's individuality and being able to do anything they want and have everything on demand when they want, you know, gestalt-wise, like abstractly. And it feels like that the tone is changing from a judger-centric civilization in at least here in the United States and country to more of a perceiver civilization and country. Yeah, well you can tell because all of our infrastructure is falling apart. <laughs> so it might not be a good thing. I I would agree. I would say that there's there's a move towards a perceiver time period. And I remember a long time ago reading in uh, your personality an owner's manual, right? Lenore Thompson's book. And it's a great book by the way. It's one of the canons of 
personality of Myers Briggs. If you're into Myers Briggs personality types, you have to read uh, personality types and owner's manual. No, did I say your is a personality types an owner's manual by Lenore Thompson, and I remember her in there saying that we had been in a perceiving time period, a perceiver time period, and that we needed to go back to being more judger. She's in, I believe, she um, her best fit type is INTJ. And I was like, really? That's interesting that she would have perceived the past as being a perceiver time period. I can kind of understand that, but I believe that what happened, she probably wrote that in the 90s, maybe, maybe early 2000s. I feel like we ramped up that. I th- I feel like we've gone very perceiver. Not necessarily in who's controlling things, but in what we say we value. And in some ways, that's... Maybe that's necessary right now. I'm going to get, I'm like officially going off of the grass is greener topic and and into my personal opinions about how the universe works. And then I'll weave my way back to grass is greener. But I almost wonder if in some ways we have to go to a more perceiver time period because we're losing our, well, actually, this is a chicken or egg. All right. You're hearing thoughts for the first time come out on the podcast right now. Those of you who just listen for, you know, for bullet pointed content are officially like, oh, God, this I hate it when they go into ramble. But we're going to ramble. I guess we've been rambled the whole time. Anyway, so because we're getting away from the judger, the judger like sort of uh, experience, then we're losing our institutions and our infrastructures. We're, uh, we're losing our our more cohesive group institutions. And because we're going towards more of a perceiver time period, that means that we're having to figure out our our identities as individuals. And perceivers are better for that. They're better for the going into that introverted thinking or introverted feeling place, accuracy or authenticity, because that is how they figure out their value systems, right, is by going inward and figuring out what their identity would say. So that's good. It's good that we're in a time period. Maybe it's because of postmodernism. Maybe our institutions and infrastructures have to break down for some reason. Maybe it's that whole Hindu concept of Shiva and Shakti where one comes through and decimates and destroys in order to make it clear for something new to grow out of. That would be cool. But regardless of what's going on, that is or why it's going on, that is what's happening. We are going towards a more perceiver time period of individualized identity and it's a it's a it's pretty destabilizing. It's very destabilizing, I think, um, in general. And I don't think we should be here for that long or too long because I think we do need institutions to at least exist, so that when we're going through different, you know, levels of development. Let's talk about the Graves model. Everybody's got to have a good Graves Four experience. Graves Four is all about finding who you are based on institutions, right? Like, who am I? You know, I'm part of something bigger. And if we don't have any institutions for people to find their identity within that, regardless of whether or not they're judges or perceivers, there's this whole huge, you know, sort of gaping hole of development that is going to um, be fostered because we're going to perceiver. So I would say that one of the ways I told you I'd bring it back around. One of the ways that I envy judges is that I envy their ability to ma- maintain those institutions. Not that they don't have individualized identity. Of course they do. Every human being has the capacity for individualized identity, just like every human being has the capacity to be a part of something bigger than themselves, right? And be a part of something that's a group. So we all have both of them available to us. But I envy that judges find their place in groups so much easier than I do. Once again, maybe this is just like me feeling like an outsider looking in. But when I'm in a group, I I never quite feel like I'm part of the group. It's very rare for me to feel that way. Very like the group has to be very handpicked, and tribes are almost impossible to find, or at least they have been for me. And so I admire that judges are very good at doing that. It feels almost seamlessly. They're good at creating them too. They're good at like getting people together cohesively, and creating those groups and those those structures. So that's something as a perceiver I very much admire about judges, and I and I wish we had more of it in society right now. I I think that you're right about the idea of postmodernism. So. This idea of a meta perspective, or meta you know, meta narrative, is kind of what modernism was all about. You know, communism versus capitalism versus you know, like these atheism versus Christianity. These big giant meta narrative conversations, and you fit under this. You might have variations of it, like you know, you might have a certain type of capitalist or a certain type of Christian or a certain type of communist. But it was a big meta narrative. But those meta narratives have broken down, and everything is individually selected. 
And so I think perceivers are going to have a much easier time of it because they're focused on the individual level, like you said. Moving through that world is going to become it's going to become more natural for us as perceivers to move through a world that doesn't have an extroverted meta narrative that we're tethering to. People that use extroverted thinking and extroverted feeling, you know, judges and the Myers Briggs system. I'm assuming that they feel a little bit of a like there's no meta narrative. It almost feels like what do I do? I don't know what to do. It's like the reverse of envying. I kind of feel like oh that must feel tough for you if you're a judge or listening. And the world seems so individualized, so much about the individual deciding what they want to do for themselves. To you, that might seem inefficient, or it's not getting people's needs met because it's like, well, if we're focused on every single individual, we'll never build anything. We're never going to create a society where everybody has the same manners or the same social decorum with each other. And it feels like, it almost feels like right now there's even a push to try to push some of those narratives, those meta narratives, back in, get everybody on the same page. If we get everybody on the same page, it's all going to be okay. And I think that comes from a lot of judger ideas, right? So I think that that's something, and, and rightly so, there's some cohesion when, it, when judger thought is in charge, extroverted feeling, extroverted thinking is in charge, it does feel like everybody is on the same page. There's not as much individual expression allowed, but you are able to, as a group, kind of agree to do things together collectively. So it's a push-pull. But I, I can appreciate judges envying perceivers right now in this time period because of this push away from meta narrative. Yeah, it's that concept of the speed of trust, which yeah. you and I have talked about. There's a book called The Speed of Trust, which is that if you trust somebody, there's a lot less sort of um, preamble you have to do before you can get into action and make things happen. And right now, we're having a hard time with the speed of trust in society in general. So I think that getting everybody on the same page, having those judger sentiments, I think that that's part of having that speed of trust. That said, I think also there's there's one more like like zoomed in, like less sort of zoomed out perspective on on society and commentary on society. I think at, like just in general, one of the things I admire the most about judgers is that they seem to have a rhythm, like they have a rhythm of life. Almost like the concept of the circadian rhythm, that how we sort of plug ourselves into the days and like the rising, you know, of the sun and the setting of the sun and this sort of like, you know, what are your circadian rhythms and what what are the the rhythms in nature that you most easily, you know, fall into? And I've just like I just don't feel like I have a circadian rhythm. We, we do. It's called always running late. I know. It's like it's this terrible thing where I'm constantly trying to routinize my life or ritualize my life or just get into some sort of rhythm. And I can't seem to figure out which one mine is. The rhythm is waking up every morning going, oh, crap, that was today. It, yeah, that's exactly that's, it. that's the rhythm. That's the rhythm. That's the rhythm of life. The rhythm of life is like perpetually being like surprised and caught short. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I totally admire Judger's ability to have a rhythm, just sure. sort of this pace, this, I don't know, I don't I don't even know what to call it, but I, I stand back and I'm just in awe of it because I keep trying to implement it in my life and it's not, like I have to, I have to rely on the Judger rhythms around me to plug into. Like one of the challenges that we have is that, you know, Piper, she's, she does cyber school now, uh, right now at home. So that means that we collectively have to be responsible for her rhythm of school as opposed to putting her into like some Montessori or something where they would be responsible for it. And my perceiver nature doesn't want to hand myself over to that kind of time clock, but then another part of me is like, yeah, but then you wouldn't have to do it. You wouldn't have to think about it. Somebody else would be doing it. And that, you know, that sounds amazing to me. So this idea of having that that internal clock, that rhythm, that steadiness, you know, that that's I, I have a lot of admiration for that. And that's the basis of the tortoise and the hare, right? Like let's pretend the tortoise is the judger and the hare is the perceiver. And as fast as the perceiver or the hare is, it's still like sort of that slow and steady that wins the race. And I admire that. I agree about the rhythm thing. And I, I still maintain, though, that perceivers do have, a, they're going to have a better time of it right now, having to determine individuality in the midst of this meta narrative breaking down. So I really appreciate being a perceiver in the world that's being created right now. I think it's going to be, it's hard to learn how to interface but I think there's there is a benefit to being a perceiver right now. I, I enjoy it. I'm sure I'm sure that there's limitations too, but I'm looking at a lot of the benefits in front of me and I'm really appreciating being a perceiver. I think there's really good things with it. What do you like about being a perceiver that doesn't have to do with society? 
I think be able to turn on a dime, pull things out. I mean, just this podcast is kind of an example. I love being able to sit down, have a concept or idea, maybe a couple bullet point notes and being able to create and not have such a barrier of entry to get to the thing. Like, I think I love about what I love about being a perceiver personally, this is my experience, is being able to just go and do it without having to do so much setup or hook it, you know, connect it to something that's like on a timeline over a longer period of time. I don't need notes. I don't need to, I mean, maybe it would be better to have notes, <laughs> maybe more organized sometimes, but there's something that's raw and fresh about being able to create in, the, in real time, in the moment, being able to perceive and just pivot on a dime and being able to show up to the world that way. That's very freeing. Now, sometimes it can create a lot of stress, but it's very freeing and I wouldn't trade it. I love being a perceiver because of that. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So as we've been talking about some of these things, and Tony and I have been talking a little bit of personal stuff in our lives, some of the things that we may have envy around, I'm sure as you've been listening along, you've been thinking about the stuff you've been envying in your life. You know, if you're a perceiver, what you envy about judges, if you're an extrovert, what you envy about introverts, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sure some stuff came up for you. I wanted to just bring this kind of down into something that might be helpful for us to think about. I've got three words I wrote down as we were talking, and Tony, I wanted to share. Number one is body, number two is focus, and number three is develop. And the the first thing I want to say is, as we're talking about this, my old Christian days are coming to me. There's this there's this passage in Scripture. I think it's in Corinthians. I couldn't. I could be wrong. It talks about the body of of the church and like the body of Christ. This idea of a body and how everybody functions in a like the the church or the Christian circles that I was grew up in. It had this concept of functioning in a body. You have the eyes, you have the head, you have the feet, you've got the, the hands, you've got the ears, you've got different parts, the, the heart of the body, and each person in, in your church would represent a different aspect of that. So you're all part of one group together, but you play different roles in the world. And as we've been talking, I was thinking a lot about that. One of the things in my mind, when I start to have envy for other people, I start to think about, well, they're playing a role I don't necessarily play. So that just kind of came to my mind, and I think even about sports teams, you know, like if everybody's chasing the soccer ball on a field, no one's in their correct zone playing their zone. We all have to stay in the role we're supposed to play. So when the ball's kicked to my side of the field, I can receive the ball and go try to score a goal. The goalie can't leave the goalpost, or now the goal is left open. So this idea that we need different people in our lives, and that really helps me when, I, when envy comes up or things that I long to be different around. I remember that kind of that old spiritual training. I don't really remember the exact passage because it's been a while since I've been in that world. But I remember that. And I think, you know, that is kind of how life is. Like we need different representations. This is my personal belief. We need different representations of all the different personality types to show up to the world because we each have different strengths, things that challenge us, and we can cover each other's blind spots. It's really powerful to think in those terms. And that that helps me deal with it a lot. The second word I wrote down is focus. And when I think in terms of the things I envy, one of the things I envy personally, and you might have this experience too listening, you tend to envy the things that other people are good at that you're not good at. I remember reading Peter Drucker, The Effective Executive, like when I was a teenager, <laughs> nerdy stuff to read when you're a teenager. But he talks about how so many people try to fix their, fix their flaws. And he said, if you want to be an effective executive or you want to be effective in the world, focus on the things you're good at and amplify those. Don't spend all your time trying to fix the things you're not good at because you're never going to fix them. That's just what you're not good at either get other people to cover them or through your strengths, just developing your strengths so well, you're not going to have those be a problem because you're going to be so good at the things you are good at and you're going to amp those up. I thought that's really interesting as we focus around this idea of envy or type envy or anything like this. If you are so preoccupied with the things you're not good at, of course, you're going to have envy for other types that have those things as strengths. Of course, you're going to go, man, I'm not good enough. You know, I'm not a thinker. I envy thinkers ability to just grab data off the top of their heads and be able to manipulate it and hold it in, in a careful way and then articulate it so well. But if I focus on that, then I'm not showing up with what I do best, which is embodying my introverted feeling process and getting into what motivates people and how they're motivated, how I'm motivated personally. So I think in terms of, of looking at the things your strength, you have strength around and continuing to develop those things, I think is a higher leverage activity than to try to shore up all the stuff you're not good at because you envy other people that have that as a strength. And that leads me to the third word, which was develop, which basically talks in terms of if you're going to focus on the things you're strong at, one of the best places to start, and we, we harp on this so much here at Personality Hacker, in your personality, your Myers-Briggs personality, in the car model, 
developing your co-pilot or auxiliary function is probably the best place to start because you're focusing on the strengths in your personality that you're already good at. You're focusing on, you're focusing on something that's going to round you out as an individual. You're not focused on the backseat or the lower parts of your cognitive function stack and your personality. You're focused on the thing that's going to give you the highest leverage growth. If you focus on that, you're not going to be paying attention to the stuff you're envious about with other people because you're focused on growing the part of you that's going to round you out and make you excel to amplify those strengths that I just talked about, which will help you be the right player on the field or in the body to show up as your best self playing with the entire team. So I think these things start to stack on themselves. And I think this is how we can deal with some of that type envy that might come up for us as humans. You just came up with that, huh? <laughs> well, I wrote it down as you, as you were talking earlier. Yeah. Yeah, because I <laughs> I was doing a lot of talking. <laughs> I, think cool. that was, I think that was fantastic. All right. Well, one thing we didn't get to in this podcast is we didn't talk about cognitive function envy, but I think we should kick that to a future episode and uh, and talk a little bit about like how we can maybe have a grass is greener feel around cognitive functions, or maybe we'll never talk about that. Who knows? You'll get to find out in the future, I guess. That's right. You will. And by the way, what have we talked about today? You've been here with us for this show what's resonating with you? What makes sense to you? What are you thinking? What kind of envy comes up for you as we talk about this in our lives? What have you struggled with? What do you wish could be different for you? What have you noticed coming up? We'd love to hear from you. Come over to personalityhacker.com, leave a comment, ask a question, or more importantly, share your story directly below the show. We'd love to hear from you what things are in your life around envy or grass is greener for the other side and type. We want to hear from you. Yeah, which grass is greener? I want to know. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. It's awesome. Go get it. Prep yourself for the zombie apocalypse, as we talked about in the previous podcast. Um, you can get it at any major retailer, right? Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Amazon. Or you can order it from your local bookstore so and support your local bookstore, which we think is a cool thing, too. Uh, is there? Do I say anything else? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you like this podcast, I thought I, th I said you could subscribe to us on iTunes and leave us a rating or review. Oh, right, it right, helps right. us out a lot. Okay, feed you your script. Yeah, it's been a little. Bit, uh, why? Why am I forgetting this? I don't know. You're rusty or something. I'm totally rusty. How is that? It is at the time of this recording. It is summertime still, and we are very warm. And so it, I think it's affecting our brains a little. I've been doing a little uh, running over my own words. Oh. I'm trying to hurry because I'm so hot. I'm sweaty. Yeah. So I think uh, I think that's probably affecting our brains. All right. I think you might be right. All right. So apparently what I didn't say and I'm supposed to say is that if you enjoyed this podcast, not only can you subscribe to us, which I think I already said, but you can leave us a rating and review on iTunes. That helps us out a lot. Maybe you did say that. I have no idea now. Now I'm very confused. <laughs> and <laughs> Like I, I said, it's hot. My brain started to shut down. Okay, okay, but I'm remembering my, my okay, speech. Keep going, keep going. So I'm remembering my script now. Um, and if you get our book, Personality Hacker, you can leave us a rating review of the book on Amazon. That also helps us out a lot. <sighs> That's good. That's right. There you go. All right. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we will talk with you on the next Personality Hacker podcast. Mm -hmm.